Chapter twenty seven of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty seven. But Loder did not leave London, and the hour or two on the day following his dismissal of Chilcot found him again in his sitting room. He sat at the centre table surrounded by a cloud of smoke. A pipe was between his lips, and the morning's newspapers lay in a heap beside his elbow. To the student of humanity his attitude was intensely interesting. It was the attitude of a man trammelled by the knowledge of his strength. Before him, as he sat smoking, stretched a future of absolute nothingness. And towards this blank future, one portion of his consciousness, a struggling and as yet scarcely sentient portion, pushed him inevitably, while another, a vigorous, persistent human portion, cried to him to pause. So actual, so clamorous was this silent mental combat that had raged unceasingly since the moment of his renunciation, that at last, in physical response to it, he pushed back his chair. "'It's too late,' he said aloud. "'I'm a fool. It's too late.' And then, abruptly, astonishingly, as though in direct response to his spoken thought, the door opened and Chilcot walked into the room. Slowly, Loder rose and stared at him. The feeling he acknowledged to himself was anger, but below the anger a very different sensation ran riotously strong. And it was in time to this second feeling, this sudden lawless joy, that his pulses beat as he turned a cold face on the intruder. Well, he said sternly. But Chilcot was impervious to sternness. He was mentally shaken and distressed, though outwardly irreproachable, even to the violets and the label of his coat. The violets that for a week past had been brought each morning to the door of Loder's rooms by Eve's maid. For one second, as Loder's eyes rested on the flowers, a sting of ungovernable jealousy shot through him. Then, as suddenly, it died away, superseded by another feeling, a feeling of new, spontaneous joy. Warmed by Chilcot or by himself, the flowers were a symbol. Well, he said again, in a gentler voice, Chilcot had walked to the table and laid down his hat. His face was white and the muscles of his lips twitched nervously as he drew off his gloves. "'Thank heaven you're here,' he said shortly. "'Give me something to drink.' In silence, Loder brought out the whisky and set it on the table. Then, instinctively, he turned aside. As plainly as though he saw the action, he mentally figured Chilcot's furtive glance, the furtive movement of his fingers to his waistcoat pocket, a hasty dropping of the tabloids into the glass. For an instant the sense of his tacit connivance came to him sharply. The next he flung it from him. The human inner voice was whispering its old watchword. A strong man has no time to waste over his weaker brother. When he heard Chilcot lay down his tumbler, he looked back again. "'Well, what is it?' he said. "'What have you come for?' He strove resolutely to keep his voice severe, but try as he might he could not quite subdue the eager force that lay behind his words. Once again, as on the night of their second interchange, life had become a phoenix, rising to fresh existence even while he sifted its ashes. "'Well?' he said once again. Chilcot had set down his glass. He was nervously passing his handkerchief across his lips. There was something in the gesture that attracted Loder. Looking at him more attentively, he saw what his own feelings and the other's conventional dress had blinded him to, the almost piteous panic and excitement in his visitor's eyes. "'Something's gone wrong,' he said with abrupt intuition. Chilcot started. "'Yes, no, that is, yes,' he stammered. Loder moved round the table. "'Something's gone wrong,' he repeated, "'and you've come to tell me.' The tone unnerved Chilcot. He suddenly dropped into a chair. It, it, it wasn't my fault, he began. I, oh, I've had a horrible time. Loder's lips tightened. Yes, he said. Yes, I understand. The other glanced up with a gleam of his old suspicion. It was all my nerves, Loder. Of course, yes, of course. Loder's interruption was curt. Chilcot eyed him doubtfully. Then recollection took the place of doubt and a change passed over his expression. "'It wasn't my fault,' he began hastily. "'Oh, my soul, it wasn't. It was Crapham's beastly fault for showing her into the morning-room.' 
Loder kept silent. His curiosity had flared into sudden life at the other's words, but he feared to break the shattered train of thought even by a word. In the silence, Chilcot moved uneasily. "'You see,' he went on at last, "'when I was here with you, I—I I, I felt strong. I—I—' I... He stopped. "'Yes, yes, when you were here with me you felt strong.' "'Yes, that's it. While I was here, I felt I could do the thing. But when I went home, when I—' "'When I went up to my rooms—' "'Again he paused, passing his handkerchief across his forehead. "'When you went up to your rooms—' "'Loda strove hard to keep his control. "'To my room? Oh, I forget about that. I, I forget about the night.' "'He hesitated confusedly. "'All I remember is the coming down to breakfast next morning, "'this morning, at twelve o'clock.' "'Loda turned to the table and poured himself out some whisky. "'Yes?' he acquiesced in a very quiet voice. At the word, Chalkett rose from his seat. His disquietude was very evident. Oh, there was there was a breakfast on the table when I came downstairs. Breakfast with flowers and a horrible, dazzling glare of sun. It was, it was then, Loder, as I stood and looked into the room, that the impossibility of it all came to me, that, that, that I knew I couldn't, couldn't stand it, couldn't go on. Loder swallowed his whisky slowly. His sense of overpowering curiosity held him very still, but he made no effort to prompt his companion. Again Chilcot shifted his position agitatedly. It, "'It had to be done,' he said disjointedly. "'I had to do it, then and there. The things were on the bureau, the pens and ink and telegraph forms. They tempted me.' Loder laid down his glass suddenly. An exclamation rose to his lips, but he checked it. At the slight sound of the tumbler touching the table, Chilcot turned. But there was no expression on the other's face to affright him. "'They tempted me,' he repeated hastily. "'They seemed like magnets. They seemed to draw me towards them. I sat at the bureau, staring at them for a long time. Then a terrible compulsion seized me, something you could never understand, and I caught up the nearest pen and wrote just what was in my mind. It wasn't a telegram, properly speaking. It was more a letter. I wanted you back, and I had to make myself plain.' The writing of the message seems to steady me. The mere forming of the words quieted my mind. I was almost cool when I got up from the bureau and pressed the bell. The bell? Yes, I rang for a servant. I had to send the wire myself, so I had to get a cab. His voice rose to irritability. I pressed the bell several times, but the thing had gone wrong. It wouldn't work. At last I gave it up and went into the corridor to call someone. Well? In the intense suspense of the moment, the word escaped Loder. Oh, I, I went out of the room, but there at the door, before I could call anybody, I knocked up against that idiot Greening. He was looking for me, for you, rather, after some beastly walk affair. I tried to explain that I wasn't in a state for business. I, I tried to shake him off, but he was worse than Blessington. At last, to be rid of the fellow, I, I went with him to the study. But the telegram? Loder began. Then again he checked himself. Yes? "'Yes, I understand,' he added quietly. "'I'm getting to the telegram. "'I wish you would jar me with sudden questions. "'I wasn't in the study more than a minute, "'more than five or six minutes.' "'His voice became confused. "'The strain of the connected recital was telling upon him. "'With nervous haste he made a rush for the end of his story. "'I wasn't more than seven or eight minutes in the study. "'Then as I came downstairs, Crapham met me in the hall. "'He told me that Lillian Astrup had called and wished to see me.' and that he'd shown her into the morning-room. The morning-room? Loda suddenly stepped back from the table. The morning-room? With your telegram lying on the bureau? His sudden speech and movement startled Chilcot. The blood rushed to his face, then died out, leaving it ashen. Don't, don't do that, Loda, he cried. I, I, I can't bear it. With an immense effort, Loda controlled himself. Sorry, he said. Go on. I, I'm going on. I, I tell you, I'm going on. I, I got a horrid shock when Crapham told me. Your story came clattering through my mind. I knew Lillian had come to see you. I knew there was going to be a scene. But the telegram? The telegram? Chilcot paid no heed to the interruption. He was following his own train of ideas. I knew she'd come to see you. I knew there was going to be a scene. When I got to the morning room, my hand was shaking so that I could scarcely turn the handle. Then as the door opened, I could have cried out with relief. Eve was there as well. Eve? 
"'Yes, I don't think I was ever so glad to see her in my life.' He laughed almost hysterically. "'Ah, I was quite civil to her, and she, she was quite sweet to me.' Again he laughed. Loda's lips tightened. "'You see, it saved the situation. Even if Lillian wanted to be nasty, she couldn't while Eve was there. We talked for about ten minutes. We were quite an amiable trio. Then Lillian told me why she called. She wanted to make a fourth in a theatre party at the Arcadian tonight, and I, I was so pleased and so relieved that I said yes.' <laughs> He paused and laughed again unsteadily. In his tense anxiety, Loder ground his heel into the floor. "'Go on!' he said fiercely. "'Go on!' "'Don't!' Chilcock exclaimed. I "'I'm going on! I'm, I'm going on!' He passed his handkerchief across his lips. We, "'We talked for ten minutes or so, and then Lillian left. I went with her to the hall door, but Crapham was there too, so I was still safe.' She laughed and chatted and seemed in high spirits as we crossed the hall, and she was still smiling as she waved to me from her motor. But then, Loda, then as I stood in the hall, it, it all came to me suddenly. I, I remember that Lillian must have been alone in the morning room before Eve found her. I remember the telegram. I ran back to the room, meaning to question Eve as to how long Lillian had been alone, but she had left the room. I ran to the bureau, but the telegram wasn't there. Gone? Yes. "'Gone! That's why I've come straight here.' For a moment they confronted each other. Then, moved by a sudden impulse, Loda pushed Chilcot aside and crossed the room. An instant later, the opening and shutting of doors, the hasty pulling out of drawers and moving of boxes, came from the bedroom. Chilcot, shaken and nervous, stood for a minute where his companion had left him. At last, impelled by curiosity, he too crossed the narrow passage and entered the second room. The full light streamed in through the open window. The keen spring air blew freshly across the housetops, and on the window sill a band of grimy, joyous sparrows twittered and preened themselves. In the middle of the room stood Loda. His coat was off, and round him on chairs and floor lay an array of waistcoats, gloves, and ties. For a space Chilcot stood in the doorway staring at him. Then his lips parted, and he took a step forward. Loda, he said anxiously. "'Loda, what are you going to do?' Loda turned. His shoulders were stiff, his face alight with energy. "'I'm going back,' he said, "'to unravel the tangle you have made.'" End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 28 Loder's plan of action was arrived at before he reached Trafalgar Square. The facts of the case were simple. Chilcot had left an incriminating telegram on the bureau in the morning room at Grosvenor Square. By an unlucky chance, Lillian Astrup had been shown up into that room, where she had remained alone until the moment that Eve, either by request or by accident, had found her there. The facts resolved themselves into one question. What use had Lydia made of those solitary moments? Without deviation, Loda's mind turned towards one answer. Lillian was not the woman to lose an opportunity, whether the space at her command were long or short. True, Eve too had been alone in the room, while Chilcot had accompanied Lillian to the door. But of this he made small account. Eve had been there, but Lillian had been there first. Judging by precedent, by personal character, by all human probability, it was not to be supposed that anything would have been left for the second comer. So convinced was he, that reaching Trafalgar Square he stopped and hailed a hansom. Cadogan Gardens, he called, number 33. The moments seemed very few before the cab drew up beside the curb, and he caught his second glimpse of the enamelled door with its silver fittings. The white and silver gleamed in the sunshine. Banks of cream-coloured hearthstones clustered on the window-sills, filling the clean air with a warm and fragrant scent. With that strange sensation of having lived through the scene before, Loder left the cab and walked up the steps. Instantly he pressed the bell, the door was opened by Lillian's discreet, deferential manservant. "'Is Lady Astrup at home?' he asked. The man looked thoughtful. "'Er, uh, ladyship lunched at home, sir,' he began cautiously. But Loder interrupted him. "'Ask her to see me,' he said laconically. The servant expressed no surprise. 
His only comment was to throw the door wide. "'If you'll wait in the white room, sir,' he said, "'I'll inform her ladyship.' Chilcock was evidently a frequent and a favoured visitor. In this manner, Loda, for the second time, entered the house so unfamiliar, and yet so familiar in all that it suggested. Entering the drawing-room, he had leisure to look about him. It was a beautiful room, large and lofty. Luxury was evident on every hand, but it was not the luxury that palls or offends. Each object was graceful and possessed its own intrinsic value. The atmosphere was too effeminate to appeal to him, but he acknowledged the taste and artistic delicacy it conveyed. Almost at the moment of acknowledgement, the door opened to admit Lillian. She wore the same gown of pale-coloured cloth, warmed and softened by rich furs, that she had worn on the day she and Chilcot had driven in the park. She was drawing on her gloves as she came into the room, and, pausing near the door, she looked across at Loda, and laughed in her slow, amused way. "'I thought it would be you,' she said enigmatically. Loda came forward. "'You expected me?' he said guardedly. A sudden conviction filled him that it was not the evidence of her eyes, but something at once subtler and more definite that prompted her recognition of him. She smiled. "'Why should I expect you? On the contrary, I am waiting to know why you are here.' He was silent for an instant. Then he answered in her own light tone. "'As far as that goes,' he said, "'let's make it my duty call, having dined with you. I am an old-fashioned person.' For a full second she surveyed him amusedly. Then at last she spoke. "'My dear Jack,' she laid particular stress on the name, "'I never imagined you punctilious. I should have thought bohemian would have been more the word.' Loda felt disconcerted and annoyed. Either, like himself, she was fishing for information, or she was deliberately playing with him. In his perplexity he glanced across the room towards the fireplace. Lillian saw the look. "'Won't you sit down?' she said, indicating the couch. "'I promise not to make you smoke. "'I shan't even ask you to take off your gloves.' "'Loda made no movement. "'His mind was unpleasantly upset. "'It was nearly a fortnight since he had seen Lillian, "'and in the interval her attitude had changed, "'and the change puzzled him. "'It might mean the philosophy of a woman who, "'knowing herself without adequate weapons, "'withdraws from a combat that has proved fruitless.' or it might imply the merely cat-like desire to toy with a certainty. He looked quickly at the delicate face, the green eyes somewhat obliquely set, the unreliable mouth, and instantly he inclined to the latter theory. The conviction that she possessed the telegram filled him suddenly, and with it came the desire to put his belief to the test, to know beyond question whether her smiling unconcern meant malice or mere entertainment. When you first came into the room, he said quietly. He said, I thought it would be you. Why did you say that? Again she smiled, a smile that might be malicious or might be merely amused. Oh, she answered at last, I only meant that though I had been told Jack Chilcott wanted me, it wasn't Jack Chilcott I expected to see. After her statement there was a pause. Loda's position was difficult. Instinctively convinced that, strong in the possession of her proof, she was enjoying his tantalised discomfort, he yet craved the actual evidence that should set his suspicions to rest. Acting upon the desire, he made a new beginning. "'Do you know why I came?' he asked. Lydian looked up innocently. "'It's so hard to be certain of anything in this world,' she said. "'But one is always at liberty to guess.' Again he was perplexed. Her attitude was not quite the attitude of one who controls the game, and yet he looked at her with a puzzled scrutiny. Women for him had always spelled the incomprehensible. He was at his best, his strongest, his surest, in the presence of men. Feeling his disadvantage, yet determined to gain his end, he made a last attempt. "'How did you amuse yourself at Grosvenor Square this morning, before Eve came to you?' he asked. The effort was awkwardly blunt, but it was direct. Lillian was buttoning her glove. She did not raise her head as he spoke, but her fingers paused in their task. For a second she remained motionless. Then she looked up slowly. "'Oh,' she said sweetly, 
"'So I was right in my guess. "'You did come to find out whether I sat in the morning-room "'with my hands in my lap, "'or wandered about in search of entertainment.' Loda coloured with annoyance and apprehension. Every look, every tone of Lillian's was distasteful to him. No microscope could have revealed her more fully to him than did his own eyesight. But it was not the moment for personal antipathies. There were other interests than his own at stake. With new resolution he returned her glance. Then I must still ask my first question. Why did you say, I thought it would be you? His case was direct, so direct that it disconcerted her. She laughed a little uneasily. <laughs> because I knew. How did you know? Because, she began, then again she laughed. Because, she added quickly, as if moved by a fresh impulse, Jack Chilcote made it very obvious to anyone who was in his morning room at twelve o'clock today that it would be you and not he who would be found filling his place this afternoon. It's all very well to talk about honour, but when one walks into an empty room and sees a telegram as long as a letter open on a bureau... But her sentence was never finished. Loda had heard what he came to hear. Any confession she might have to offer was of no moment in his eyes. "'My dear girl,' he broke in brusquely, "'don't trouble. I should make a most unsatisfactory father confessor.' He spoke quickly. His colour was still high, but not of annoyance. His suspense was transformed into unpleasant certainty. But the exchange left him sure of himself. His perplexity had dropped to a quiet sense of self-reliance. His paramount desire was for solitude in which to prepare for the task that lay before him. The most congenial task the world possessed, the unravelling of Chilcot's tangled skeins. Looking into Lillian's eyes, he smiled. "Goodbye," he said, holding out his hand. "'I think we've finished, for today.' She slowly extended her fingers. Her expression and attitude were slightly puzzled, a puzzlement that was either spontaneous or singularly well assumed. As their hands touched, she smiled again. "'Will you drop in at the Arcadian tonight?' she said. "'It's the dramatised version of Other Men's Shoes. The temptation to make you see it was too irresistible, as you know.' There was a pause while she waited for his answer, her head inclined to one side, her green eyes gleaming. Loda, conscious of her regard, hesitated for a moment. Then his face cleared. "'Right!' he said slowly, The Arcadian, tonight. End of chapter 28《Chapter 29 of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 29 Loder's frame of mind as he left Cadogan Gardens was peculiar. Once more he was living in the present the forceful, exhilarating present, and the knowledge braced him. Upon one point his mind was satisfied. Lilia Mastrop had found the telegram, and it remained to him to render her find valueless. How he proposed to do this, how he proposed to come out triumphant in face of such a situation, was a matter that as yet was shapeless in his mind. Nevertheless, the danger, the sense of impending conflict, had a savour of life after the inaction of the day and night just passed. Chilcot, in his weakness and his entanglement, had turned to him, and he in his strength and capacity had responded to the appeal. His step was firm and his bearing assured as he turned into Grosvenor Square and walked towards the familiar house. The habit of self-deceit is as insidious and tenacious as any vice. For one moment on the night of his great speech, as he leaned out of Chilcot's carriage and met Chilcot's eyes, Loder had seen himself and under the shock of revelation had taken decisive action. But in the hour subsequent to that action, the plausible inner voice had whispered unceasingly, soothing his wounded self-esteem, rebuilding stone by stone the temple of his egotism, until at last, when Chilcot, panic-stricken at his own action, had burst into his rooms ready to plead or to coerce, he had found no need for either coercion or entreaty. By a power more subtle and effective than any at his command, Loda had been prepared for his coming, unconsciously ready with an acquiescence before his appeal had been made. It was the fruit of this preparation, the inevitable outcome of it, that strengthened his step and steadied his hand as he mounted the steps and opened the hall door of Chilcot's house 
on that eventful afternoon. The dignity, the air of quiet solidity, impressed him as it never failed to do as he crossed the large hall and ascended the stairs, the same stairs that he had passed down almost as an outcast not so many hours before. He was filled with the sense of things regained. Belief in his own star lifted him as it had done a hundred times before in these same surroundings. He quickened his steps as the sensation came to him. Then, reaching the head of the stairs, he turned directly towards Eve's sitting-room, and, gaining the door, knocked. The strength of his eagerness, the quick beating of his pulse as he waited for a response, surprised him. He had told himself many times that his passion, however strong, would never again conquer as it had done two nights ago, and the fact that he had come thus candidly to Eve's room was to his mind a proof that temptation could be dared. Nevertheless, there was something disconcerting to a strong man in this merely physical perturbation, and when Eve's voice came to him, giving permission to enter, he paused for an instant to steady himself. Then, with sudden decision, he opened the door and walked into the room. The blinds were partly drawn. There was a scent of violets in the air, and a fire glowed warmly in the grate. He noted these things carefully, telling himself that a man should always be alertly sensible of his surroundings. Then all at once the nice balancing of detail suddenly gave way. He forgot everything but the one circumstance that Eve was standing in the window, her back to the light, her face towards him. With his pulses beating faster and an unsteady sensation in his brain, he moved forward, holding out his hand. Eve, he said below his breath. But Eve remained motionless. As he came into the room, she had glanced at him, a glance of quick, searching question. Then, with equal suddenness, she had averted her eyes. As he drew close to her now, she remained immovable. Eve, he said again, I wanted to see you. I wanted to explain about yesterday and about this morning. He paused, suddenly disturbed. The full remembrance of the scene in the broom had surged up at sight of her, had risen a fierce, unquenchable recollection. Eve, he began again, in a new, abrupt tone. And then it was that Eve showed herself in a fresh light. From his entrance into the room she had stayed motionless, save for her first glance of acute inquiry. But now her demeanour changed. For almost the first time in Loder's knowledge of her, the vitality and force that he had vaguely apprehended below her quiet, serene exterior sprang up like a flame within whose radius things were illuminated. With a quick gesture she turned towards him, her warm colour deepening, her eyes suddenly alight. "'I understand,' she said. "'I understand. Don't try to explain. Can't you see that it's enough to—to to see you as you are?' Lady was surprised. Remembering their last passionate scene, and the damper Chilcot's subsequent presence must inevitably have cast upon it, he had expected to be doubtfully received. But the reality of the reception left him bewildered. Eve's manner was not that of the ill-used wife. Its vehemence, its note of desire and deprecation, were more suggestive of his own ardent seizing of the present, as distinguished from past or future. With a nonsense of confusion he turned to her afresh. "'Then I am forgiven?' he said, and unconsciously, as he moved nearer, he touched her arm. At his touch she started. All the yielding sweetness, all the submission that had marked her two nights ago, was gone. In its place she was possessed by a curious excitement that stirred while it perplexed. Loder, moved by the sensation, took another step forward. "'Then I am forgiven?' he repeated, more softly. Her face was averted as he spoke, but he felt her arm quiver, and when at last she lifted her head, their eyes met. Neither spoke, but in an instant Loda's arms were round her. For a long, silent space they stood holding each other closely. Then, with a sharp movement, Eve freed herself. Her colour was still high, her eyes still peculiarly bright, but the bunch of violets she wore in her belt had fallen to the ground. "'John,' she said quickly, but on the word her breath caught. With a touch of nervousness she stooped to pick up the flowers. Loder noticed both voice and gesture. "'What is it?' he said. "'What were you going to say?' But she made no answer. 
For a second longer she searched for the violets. Then, as he bent to assist her, she stood up quickly and laughed, a short, embarrassed laugh. "'How absurd and nervous I am!' she exclaimed. "'Like a schoolgirl instead of a woman of twenty-four. "'You must help me to be sensible.' Her cheeks still burned, her manner was still excited, like one who holds an emotion or an impulse at bay. Loder looked at her uncertainly. "'Eve,' he began afresh, with his odd, characteristic perseverance, but she instantly checked him. There was a finality, a faint suggestion of fear in her protest. "'Don't,' she said. "'Don't. I, I don't want explanations. I want to, to enjoy the moment without having things analysed or smoothed away. Can't you understand? Can't you see that I'm wonderfully, terribly happy to, to have you as you are?' Again her voice broke, a break that might have been a laugh or a sob. The sound was an emotional crisis, as such a sound invariably is. It arrested and steadied her. For a moment she stood absolutely still. Then, with something very closely resembling her old repose of manner, she stooped again and quietly picked up the flowers still lying at her feet. Now, she said quietly, I must say what I've wanted to say all along. How does it feel to be a great man? Her manner was controlled. She looked at him evenly and directly. Save for the faint vibration in her voice, there was nothing to indicate the tumult of a moment ago. But Loder was still uncertain. He caught her hand, his eyes searching hers. But Eve, he began. Then Eve played the last card in her mysterious game. Laughing quickly and nervously, she freed her hand and laid it over his mouth. No, she said, not one word. All this past fortnight has belonged to you. Now it's my turn. Today is mine. End of chapter 29「And so, once again, the woman conquered. Whatever Eve's intentions were, whatever she wished to evade or ward off, she was successful in gaining her end. For more than two hours she kept Loda at her side. There may have been moments in those two hours when the tension was high, when the efforts she made to interest and hold him were somewhat strained. But if this was so, it escaped the notice of the one person concerned. For it was long after tea had been served, long after Eve had offered to do penance for a monopoly of him by driving him to Chilcot's club, that Loda realised with any degree of distinctness that it was she, and not he, who had taken the lead in their interview, that it was she and not he who had bridged the difficult silences and given a fresh direction to dangerous channels of talk. It was long before he recognised this, but it was still longer before he realised the far more potent fact that, without any coldness, without any lessening of the subtle consideration she always showed him, she had given him no further opportunity of making love. Talking continuously, elated with the sense of conflicts still to come, he drove with her to the club. Considering that drive in the light of after events, his own frame of mind invariably filled him with incredulity. In the eyes of any sane man, his position was not worth an hour's purchase. Yet, in the blind self-confidence of the moment, he would not have changed places with Freyd himself. The great song of Self was sounding in his ears as he drove through the crowded streets, conscious of the cool, crisp air, of Eve's close presence, of the numberless infinitesimal things that went to make up the value of life. It was this acknowledgment of personality that upheld him. The personality the power that had carried him unswervingly through eleven colourless years, that had impelled him towards this new career when the new career had first been opened to him, that had hewn away for him in this fresh existence against colossal odds. The indomitable force that had trampled out Chilcot's footmarks in public life, in private life, in love. It was a triumphant paean that clamoured in his ears, something persistent and prophetic with an undernote of menace the cry of the human soul that has dared to stand alone. His glance was keen and bright as he waited for a moment at the carriage door and took Eve's hand before entering the club. "'You're dining out tonight?' he said. 
His fingers, always tenacious and masterful, continued to hold hers. The compunction that had driven him temporarily towards sacrifice had passed. His pride, his confidence, and with them his desire, had flowed back in full measure. Eve, watching him attentively, paled a little. Yes, she said, I'm dining with the Bramfels. What time would you get home? He scarcely realised why he put the question. The song of self still sounded triumphantly, and he responded without reflection. His eyes held hers, his fingers pressed her hand. The intense mastery of his will passed through her in a sudden sense of fear. Her lips parted in deprecation, but he, closely attentive of her expression, spoke again quickly. "'When can I see you?' he asked, very quietly. Again she was about to speak. She leaned forward, as if some thought long suppressed trembled on her lips. Then her courage, or her desire, failed her. She leaned back, letting her lashes droop over her eyes. "'I shall be home at eleven, she said below her breath. Loda dined with Lately at Chilcot's Club, and so absorbing were the political interests of the hour, the resignation of Sir Robert Sefra, the King's summoning afraid, the probable features of the new ministry, that it was after nine o'clock when at last he freed himself and drove to the Arcadian Theatre. The sound of music came to him as he entered the theatre, light, measured music, suggestive of tiny streams, toy lambs, and painted shepherdesses. It sounded singularly inappropriate to his mood, as inappropriate as the theatre itself with its gay gilding, its pale tones of pink and blue. It was the setting of a different world, a world of laughter, light thoughts, and shallow impulses, in which he had no part. He halted for an instant outside the box to which the attendant had shown him. Then, as the door was thrown open, he straightened himself resolutely and stepped forward. It was the interval between the first and second acts. The box was in shadow, and Loda's first impression was of voices and rustling skirts, broken in upon by the murmur of frequent, amused laughter. Later, as his eyes grew accustomed to the light, he distinguished the occupants, two women and a man. The man was speaking as he entered, and the story he was relating was evidently interesting from the faint exclamations of question and to delight that punctuated it in the listener's higher, softer voices. As the newcomer entered, they all three turned and looked at him. "'Ah, here comes the legislator!' exclaimed Leonard Kane, for it was he who formed the male element in the party. "'The revolution, real any?' Lillian corrected softly. "'Bramble says he's changed the whole face of things.' She laughed softly and meaningly as she closed her fan. "'So good of you to come, Jack,' she added. "'Let me introduce you to Miss Esseltyn. "'I don't think you two have met. "'This is Mr. Chilcot, Mary, the great new Mr. Chilcot.' Again she laughed. Loda bowed and moved to the front of the box, nodding to Kane as he passed. "'It's only for an hour,' he explained to Lillian. "'I have an appointment for eleven. He turned and bowed to the third occupant of the box, a remarkably young and well-dressed girl with wide-awake eyes and a retrousse nose. "'Only an hour? Oh, how unkind! How should I punish him, Lenny?' Lillian looked round at Kane with a lingering, caressing glance. He bent towards her in quick response and answered in a whisper. She laughed and replied in an equally low tone. Loda, to whom both remarks had been inaudible, dropped into the vacant seat beside Mary Esselton. He had the unsettled feeling that things were not falling out exactly as he had calculated. "'What is the play like?' he hazarded as he looked towards his companion. At all times social trivialities bored him. Tonight they were intolerable. He had come to fight, but all at once it seemed that there was no opponent. Lillian's attitude disturbed him. Her careless graciousness, her evident ignoring of him for Cain, might mean nothing but also it might mean much. So he speculated as he put his question and spurred his attention towards the girl's answer. But with the speculation came the resolve to hold his own, to meet his enemy upon whatever ground she chose to appropriate. The girl looked at him with interest. She too had heard of his triumph. "'It is a good play,' she responded. "'I like it better than the book. You've read the book, of course.' "'No,' Loda tried hard to fix his thoughts. "'It's amusing, but far-fetched. "'Indeed.' "'He picked up the programme lying on the edge of the box. 
His ears were strained to catch the tone of Lillian's voice as she laughed and whispered with Cain. "'Yes, men exchanging identities, you know.' He looked up and caught the girl's self-possessed glance. "'Oh,' he said, "'indeed.' Then again he looked away. It was intolerable, this feeling of being caged up. A sense of anger crept through his mind. It almost seemed that Lillian had brought him there to prove that she had finished with him, had cast him aside, having used him for the day's excitement, as she had used her poodles, her Persian cats, her crystal-gazing. All at once the impotency and uncertainty of his position goaded him. Turning swiftly in his seat, he glanced back to where she sat, slowly swaying her fan, her pale golden hair, and her pale-coloured gown delicately silhouetted against the background of the box. "'What's your idea of the play, Lillian?' he said abruptly. To his own ears there was a note of challenge in his voice. She looked round languidly. "'Oh, it's quite amusing,' she said. "'It makes a delicious farce. Absolutely French.' "'French? Quite. Don't you think so, Lenny?' "'Oh, quite,' Kane agreed. "'They mean that it's so very light, and yet so very subtle,' Mr. Chilcott, Mary Estelin explained. "'Indeed,' he said. "'Then my imagination was at fault. I thought the piece was serious.' "'Serious?' Lillian smiled again. "'Why, where's your sense of humour? "'The motive of the play debars all seriousness.' "'Loder looked down at the programme still between his hands. "'What is the motive?' he asked. "'Lillian waved her fan once or twice, then closed it softly. "'Love is the motive,' she said. "'Now the balancing, the adjusting of impression and inspirations "'of all processes in life, the most delicately fine.' The simple sound of the word love, coming at that precise juncture, changed the whole current of Loder's thought. It fell like a seed, and like a seed in ultra-productive soil, it bore fruit with amazing rapidity. The word itself was small, and the manner in which it was spoken trivial, but Loder's mind was attractive and held by it. The last time it had met his ears, his environment had been vastly different, and this echo of it in an uncongenial atmosphere stung him to resentment. The vision of Eve, the thought of Eve, became suddenly dominant. "'Love?' he repeated coldly. "'So love is the motive?' "'Yes.' This time it was Cain who responded in his methodical, contented voice. "'The motive of the play is love, as Lillian says. And when was love ever serious in a three-act comedy, on or off the stage?' He leaned forward in his seat, screwed in his eyeglass, and lazily scanned the stalls. The orchestra was playing a Hungarian dance, its erratic harmonies and wild alternations of expression falling abruptly across the pinks and blues, the gilding and lights of the pretty conventional theatre. Something in the suggestion of unfitness appealed to Loder. It was the force of the real as opposed to the ideal. With a new expression on his face, he turned again to Cain. "'And how does it work?' he said. "'This treatment that you find so French?' His voice, as well as his expression, had changed. He still spoke quietly, but he spoke with interest. He was no longer conscious of his vague uneasiness. A fresh chord had been struck in his mind, and his curiosity had responded to it. For the first time it occurred to him that love, the dangerous, mysterious garden whose paths had so suddenly stretched out before his own feet, was a pleasure-ground that possessed many doors and an infinite number of keys. He was stirred by the desire to peer through another entrance than his own, to see the secret alluring byways from another standpoint. He waited with interest for the answer to his question. For a second or two, Cain continued to survey the house. Then his eyeglass dropped from his eye, and he turned round. "'To understand the thing,' he said pleasantly, "'you must have read the book. Have you read the book?' "'No, Mr. Cain,' Mary Estelin interrupted. "'Mr. Chalcott hasn't read the book.' Lillian laughed. "'Outline the story for him, Lenny,' she said. "'I love to see other people taking pains.' Cain glanced at her admiringly. "'Well, to begin with,' he said amiably, two men, an artist and a millionaire, exchange lives. See?' "'You may presume that he does see, Lenny.' "'Right. Well, then, as I say, these beggars change identities. They're as like as pins, and to all appearances one chap's the other chap, and the other chap's the first chap.' See? Loder laughed. 
the newly quickened interest was enhanced by treading on dangerous ground. "'Well, they change for a lark, of course, but there's one fact they both overlook. They're men, you know, and they forget these little things.' He laughed delightedly. "'They overlook the fact that one of them has got a wife.' There was a crash of music from the orchestra. Loder sat straighter in his seat. He was conscious that the blood had rushed into his face. "'Oh, indeed,' he said quickly. "'One of them had a wife.' Exactly, again Kane chuckled, and the point of the joke is that the wife is the least larky person under the sun, see? A second hot wave passed over Loder's face, a sense of mental disgust filled him. This, then, was the wonderful garden seen from another standpoint. He looked from Lillian, graceful, sceptical, and shallow, to the young girl beside him, so frankly modern in her appreciation of life. This, then, was love as seen by the eyes of the world the world that accepts, judges, and condemns in a slang phrase or two. "'And the end of the story?' he asked in a strained voice. "'The end? Oh, usual end, of course. Chap makes a mess of things and the bubble bursts.' "'And the end of the wife?' "'The end of the wife?' Lillian broke in with a little laugh. "'Why, the end of all stupid people, who, instead of going through life with a lot of delightfully human stumbles, come just one big cropper!' She naturally ends in the divorce court. They all laughed boisterously. Then laughter, story, and denouement were all drowned in a tumultuous crash of music. The orchestra ceased, there was a slight hum of applause, and the curtain rose on the second act of the comedy. End of chapter 30《ラブリーオブ・ザ・マスカレーダー》by Catherine Cecil Thurston。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers。Chapter 31 A few minutes before the curtain fell on the second act of Other Men's Shoes, Loder rose from his seat and made his apologies to Lillian. At any other moment he might have pondered over her manner of accepting them, the easy indifference with which she let him go. But vastly keener issues were claiming his attention, issues whose results were wide and black. He left the theatre, and, refusing the overtures of cabmen, set himself to walk to Chilcot's house. His face was hard and emotionless as he hurried forward, but the chaos in his mind found expression in the unevenness of his pace. To a strong man the confronting of difficulties is never alarming and is often fraught with inspiration, but this applies essentially to the difficulties evolved through the weakness, the folly, or the force of another. When they arise from within, the matter is of another character. It is in presence of his own soul, and in that presence alone, that a man may truly measure himself. As Loder walked onward, treading the whole familiar length of traffic-filled street, he realised for the first time that he was standing before that solemn tribunal that the hour had come when he must answer to himself for himself. The longer and deeper an oblivion, the more painful the awakening. For months the song of self had beaten about his ears, deadening all other sounds. Now, abruptly, that song had ceased, not considerately, not lingeringly, but with a suddenness that made the succeeding silence very terrible. He walked onward, keeping his direction unseeingly. He was passing through the fire as surely as though actual flames rose about his feet. And whatever the result, whatever the fibre of the man who emerged from the ordeal, the John Loder, who had hewn his way through the past weeks, would exist no more. The triumphant egotist, the strong man, who by his own strength had kept his eyes upon one point, refusing to see in other directions, had ceased to be. Keen though it was, his realisation of this crisis in his life had come with characteristic slowness. When Lillian Astrup had given her dictum, when the music of the orchestra had ceased and the curtain risen on the second act of the play, nothing but a sense of stupefaction had filled his mind. In that moment the great song was silenced, not by any portentous episode, not by any incident that could have lent dignity to its end, but, with the full meaning of life's irony, by a trivial social commonplace. In the first sensation of blank loss his faculties had been numbed, in the quarter of an hour that followed the rise of the curtain, he had sat staring at the stage, seeing nothing, hearing nothing, filled with the enormity of the void that suddenly surrounded him. 
Then, from habit, from constitutional tendency, he begun slowly and perseveringly to draw first one thread and then another from the tangle of his thoughts, to forge with doubt and difficulty the chain that was to draw him towards the future. It was upon this same incomplete and yet tenacious chain that his mind worked as he traversed the familiar streets and at last gained the house he had so easily learned to call home. As he inserted the latch-key and felt it move smoothly in the lock, a momentary revolt against his own judgment, his own censorship, swung him sharply towards reaction. But it is only the blind who can walk without a tremor on the edge of an abyss, and there was no longer a bandage across his eyes. The reaction flared up like a strip of lighted paper. Then, like a strip of lighted paper, he dropped back to ashes. He pushed the door open and slowly crossed the hall. The mounting of a staircase is often the index to a man's state of mind. As Loder ascended the stairs of Chilcot's house, his shoulders lacked their stiffness, his head was no longer erect. He moved as though his feet were weighted. He had ceased to be the man of achievement whose smallest opinion compels consideration. In the privacy of solitude he was the mere human flotsam to which he had once compared himself, the flotsam that, dreaming it has found a harbour, wakes to find itself the prey of the incoming tide. He paused at the head of the stairs to rally his resolutions. Then, still walking heavily, he passed down the corridor to Eve's room. It was suggestive as his character that, having made his decision, he did not dally over its performance. Without waiting to knock, he turned the handle and walked into the room. It looked precisely as it always looked, but to Loder, the rich, subdued colouring of books and flowers, the whole air of culture and repose that the place conveyed, seemed to hold a deeper meaning than before, and it was on the instant that his eyes, crossing the inanimate objects, rested on their owner, that the true force of his position, the enormity of the task before him, made itself plain. Realisation came to him with vivid, overwhelming force, and it must be accounted to his credit, in the summing of his qualities, that then, in that moment of trial, the thought of retreat, the thought of yielding, did not present itself. Eve was standing by the mantelpiece. She wore a beautiful gown, a long string of diamonds was twisted about her neck, and her soft black hair was coiled high after a foreign fashion, and held in place by a large diamond comb. As he entered, she turned hastily, almost nervously, and looked at him with the rapid, searching glance he had learned to expect from her. Then almost directly her expression changed to one of quick concern. With a faint exclamation of alarm she stepped forward. "'What has happened?' she said. "'You look like a ghost.' Loda made no answer. Moving into the room, he paused by the oak table that stood between the fireplace and the door. They made an unconscious tableau as they stood there. He, with his hard, set face, she with her heightened colour, her inexplicably bright eyes. They stood completely silent for a space, a space that for Loder held no suggestion of time. Then, finding the tension unbearable, Eve spoke again. "'Has anything happened?' she asked. "'Is anything wrong?' Had he been less engrossed, the intensity of her concern might have struck him. But in a mind so harassed as his, there was only room for one consideration— the consideration of himself. The sense of her question reached him, but its significance left him untouched. "'Is anything wrong?' she reiterated for the second time. By an effort he raised his eyes. No man, he thought, since the beginning of the world was ever set a task so cruel as his. Painfully and slowly his lips parted. "'Everything in the world is wrong,' he said in a slow, hard voice. Eve said nothing, but her colour suddenly deepened. Again Loder was unobservant, but with the dogged resolution that marked him, he forced himself to his task. "'You despise lies,' he said at last. "'Tell me what you would think of a man whose whole life was one elaborated lie?' The words were slightly exaggerated, but their utterance, their painfully brusque sincerity, precluded all suggestion of effect. Resolutely holding her gaze, he repeated his question. "'Tell me, answer me, I want to know.' 
Eve's attitude was difficult to read. She stood twisting the string of diamonds between her fingers. "'Tell me,' he said again. She continued to look at him for a moment. Then, as if some fresh impulse moved her, she turned away from him towards the fire. "'I cannot,' she said. "'We, I, we, I, I could not set myself to judge anyone.' Loder held himself rigidly in hand. "'Eve,' he said quietly, "'I was at the Arcadian tonight. "'The play was Other Men's Shoes. "'I suppose you've read the book, Other Men's Shoes.' "'She was leaning on the mantelpiece, "'and her face was invisible to him. "'Yes, I have read it,' she said, without looking round. "'It is the story of an extraordinary likeness between two men. "'Do you believe such a likeness possible?' "'Do you think such a thing could exist?' He spoke with difficulty. His brain and tongue both felt numb. Eve let the diamond chain slip from her fingers. "'Yes,' she said nervously. "'Yes, I do believe it. Such things have been—' Loda caught at the words. "'You're quite right,' he said quickly. "'You're quite right. The thing is possible. I've proved it. I know a man so like me that you, even you, could not tell us apart.' Eve was silent, still averting her face. In dire difficulty he laboured on. "'Eve,' he began once more, "'such a likeness is a serious thing, a terrible danger, a terrible temptation. Those who have no experience of it cannot possibly gauge its pitfalls.' Again he paused, but again the silent figure by the fireplace gave him no help. "'Eve!' he exclaimed suddenly. "'If you only knew, if you only guessed what I am trying to say—' The perplexity, the whole harassed suffering of his mind showed in the words. Loder, the strong, the resourceful, the self-contained, was palpably, painfully, at a loss. There was almost a note of appeal in the vibration of his voice. And Eve, standing by the fireplace, heard and understood. In that moment of comprehension, all that had held her silent, all the conflicting motives that have forbidden speech, melted away before the unconscious demand for help. Quietly, and yet quickly, she turned, her whole face transfigured by a light that seemed to shine from within, something singularly soft and tender. "'There's no need to say anything,' she said simply, "'because I know.' It came quietly, as most great revelations come. Her voice was low and free from any excitement, her face beautiful in its complete unconsciousness of self. In that supreme moment, all her thought, all her sympathy, was for the man and his suffering. To Loder there was a space of incredulity. Then his brain slowly swung to realisation. "'You know?' he repeated blankly. "'You know?' Without answering, she walked to a cabinet that stood in the window, unlocked a drawer, and drew out several sheets of flimsy white paper, crumpled in places and closely covered with writing. Without a word, she carried them back and held them out. He took them in silence, scanned them, then looked up. In a long, worthless pause, their eyes met. It was as if each looked speechlessly into the other's heart, seeing the passions, the contradictions, the shortcomings that went to the making of both. In that silence they drew closer together than they could have done through a torrent of words. There was no asking of forgiveness, no elaborate confession on either side. In the deep, eloquent pause they mutually saw and mutually understood. "'When I came into the morning-room today,' Eve said at last, "'and saw Lillian Astrup reading that telegram, "'nothing could have seemed further from me than the thought that I should follow her example.' It was not until afterwards, not until he came into the room, until I saw that you, as I believed, had fallen back again from what I respected to what I despised, that I knew how human I really was. As I watched them laugh and talk, I felt suddenly that I was alone again, terribly alone. I I think I, I believe I was jealous in that moment. She hesitated. Eve, he exclaimed but she broke in quickly on the word. I felt different in that moment. I didn't care about honour or things like honour. After they had gone, it seemed to me 
that I had missed something, something that they possessed. How oh, you don't know what a woman feels when she is jealous. Again she paused. It was then that the telegram, and the thought of Lillian's amused smile as she read it, came to my mind. Feeling as I did, acting on what I felt, I crossed to the bureau and picked it up. In one second I had seen enough to make it impossible to draw back. Oh, it may have been dishonourable, it may have been mean. But I wonder if any woman in the world would have done otherwise. I crumped up the papers just as they were, and carried them to my own room. From the first to the last word of Eve's story, Loda's eyes never left her face. Instantly she had finished, his voice broke forth in irrepressible question. In that wonderful space of time he had learned many things. All his seductions, all his apprehensions had been scattered and disproved. He had seen the true meaning of Lydia Astrup's amused indifference, the indifference of a variable, flippant nature, that, robbed of any real weapon for mischief, soon tires of a game that promises to be too arduous. He saw all this, and understood it with a rapidity born of the moment. Nevertheless, when Eve ceased to speak, the question that broke from him was not connected with this great discovery, was not even suggestive of it. It was something quite immaterial to any real issue, but something that overshadowed every consideration in the world. Eve, he said, tell me your first thought, your first thought after the shock and the surprise, when you remembered me. There was a fresh pause, but one of very short duration. Then Eve met his glance fearlessly and frankly. The same pride and dignity, the same indescribable tenderness that had responded to his first appeal, shone in her face. My first thought was a great thankfulness, she said simply, a thankfulness that you, that no man, could ever understand. End of chapter 31Chapter 32 of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 32 As she finished speaking, Eve did not lower her eyes. To her there was no suggestion of shame in her thoughts or her words, but to Loda, watching and listening, there was a perilous meaning contained in both. Thankfulness? he repeated slowly. From his newly stirred sense of responsibility, pity and sympathy were gradually rising. He had never seen Eve as he saw her now, and his vision was all the clearer for the long oblivion. With a poignant sense of compassion and remorse, the knowledge of her youth came to him, the youth that some women preserve in the midst of the world, when circumstances have permitted them to see much, but to experience little. Thankfulness, he said again, incredulously, a slight smile touched her lips. Yes, she answered softly. Thankfulness that my trust had been rightly placed. She spoke simply and confidently, but the words struck Loda more sharply than any accusation. With a heavy sense of bitterness and renunciation, he moved slowly forward. Eve, he said very gently, you don't know what you say. She had lowered her eyes as he came towards her. Now again she lifted them in a swift upward glance. For the first time since he had entered the room, a slight look of personal doubt and uneasiness showed in her face. Why, she said, I, I don't understand. For a moment he answered nothing. He had found his first explanation overwhelming. Now suddenly it seemed to him that his present difficulty was more impossible to surmount. I came here tonight to tell you something, he began at last. "'But so far I have only said half.' "'Half?' "'Yes, half.' He repeated the word quickly, avoiding the question in her eyes. Then, conscious of the need for explanation, he plunged into rapid speech. "'Fraud like mine,' he said, "'has only one safeguard, one justification, a boundless audacity. "'One shakes that audacity, and the whole motive power crumbles. "'It was to make the audacity impossible, "'to tell you the truth and make it impossible, that I came to-night.' The fact that you already knew made the telling easier, but it altered nothing. Eve raised her head, but he went resolutely on. Tonight, he said, 
I have seen into my own life, into my own mind, and my ideas have been very roughly shaken into new place. We never make so colossal a mistake as when we imagine that we know ourselves. Months ago, when your husband first proposed this scheme to me, I was, according to my own conception, a solitary being vastly ill-used by fate, who, with a fine stoicism, was leading a clean life. That is what I believed. But there, at the very outset, I deceived myself. I was simply a man who shut himself up because he cherished a grudge against life, and who lived honestly because he had a constitutional distaste for vice. My first feeling, when I saw your husband, was one of self-righteous contempt, and that has been my attitude all along. I have often marvelled at the flood of intolerance that has rushed over me at sight of him, the violent desire that has possessed me to look away from his weakness and banish the knowledge of it. But now I understand. I know now what the feeling meant. The knowledge came to me tonight. It meant that I had turned away from his weakness, because deep within myself something stirred in recognition of it. Humanity is really much simpler than we like to think, and human impulses have an extraordinary fundamental connection. Weakness is egotism, but so is strength. Chilcot has followed his vice. I have followed my ambition. It will take a higher judgment than yours or mine to say which of us has been the more selfish man. He paused and looked at her. She was watching him intently. Some of the meaning in his face had found a pained, alarmed reflection in her own. But the awe and wonder of the morning's discovery still coloured her mind too vividly to allow of other considerations possessing their proper value. The thrill of exultation with which the misgivings born of Chilcot's vice had dropped away from her mental image of Loder was still too absorbing to be easily dominated. She loved, and as if by a miracle her love had been justified. For the moment the justification was all-sufficing. Something of confidence, something of the innocence that comes not from ignorance of evil, but from a mind singularly uncontaminated, blinded her to the danger of her position. Loder, waiting apprehensively for some aid, some expression of opinion, became gradually conscious of this lack of realisation. Moved by a fresh impulse, he crossed the small space that divided them and caught her hands. "'Eve,' he said gently, "'I've been trying to analyse myself and give you the results, "'but I shan't try any more. "'I shall be quite plain with you. "'From the first moment I took your husband's place, "'I was ambitious. "'You unconsciously aroused the feeling "'when you brought me Freyd's message on the first night. "'You aroused it by your words, "'but more strongly, though more obscurely, "'by your underlying antagonism. "'On that night, though I did not know it, "'I took up my position,' I made my determination. Do you know what that determination was? She shook her head. It was the desire to stamp out Chilcot's footmarks with my own, to prove that personality is the great force capable of everything. I forgot to reckon that when we draw largely upon fate, she generally extorts a crushing interest. First came the wish for your respect, then the desire to stand well with such men as Freyd, to feel the stir of emulation and competition, to prove myself strong in the one career I knew myself really fitted for. For a time, the second ambition overshadowed the first, but the first was bound to reassert itself, and in a moment of egotism I conceived the notion of winning your enthusiasm as well as your respect. E's face, alert and questioning, suddenly paled as a doubt crossed her mind. Then it was only... "'Only to stand well with me?' "'I believed it was only the desire to stand well with you. "'I believed it until the night of my speech, "'if you can credit anything so absurd. "'Then on that night, as I came up the stairs to the gallery, "'and I saw you standing there, "'the blindness fell away, and I knew that I loved you.' "'As he said the last words, he released her hands and turned aside, "'missing the quick wave of joy and colour that crossed her face.' I knew it, but it made no difference. I was only moved to a higher self-glorification. I touched supremacy that night. But as we drove home, I experienced the strangest coincidence of my life. You remember the block in the traffic at Piccadilly? Again, Eve bent her head. Well, when I looked out of the carriage window to discover its cause, the first man I saw was Chilcot. Eve started slightly. 
This swift, unexpected linking of Chilcot's name with the most exalted moment of her life stirred her unpleasantly. Some glimmering of Loder's intention in so linking it broke through the web of disturbed and conflicting thoughts. "'You saw him on that night?' "'Yes, and the sight chilled me. It was a big drop from supremacy to the remembrance of everything.' Involuntarily she put out her hand. But Loder shook his head. "'No,' he said. "'Don't pity me. The sight of him came just in time. I had a reaction in that moment, and such as it was, I acted on it. I went to him next morning and told him that the thing must end. But then, even then, I shirked being honest with myself. I had meant to tell him that it must end because I had grown to love you. But my pride rose up and tied my tongue. I could not humiliate myself. I put the case before him in another light. It was a tussle of wills, and I won. But the victory was not what it should have been. That was proved to-day when he returned to tell me of the loss of this telegram. It wasn't the fear that Lady Astrop had found it. It wasn't to save the position that I jumped at the chance of coming back. It was to feel the joy of living, the joy of seeing you, if only for a day. For one second he turned towards her, then as abruptly he turned away again. I was still thinking of myself, he said. I was still utterly self-centred when I came to this room to-day, and allowed you to talk to me when I asked you to see me to-night as we parted at the club. I shan't tell you the thoughts that unconsciously were in my mind when I asked that favour. You must understand without explanation. I went to the theatre with Lady Astrup ostensibly to find out how the land lay in her direction, really to heighten my self-esteem. But there, fate, or the power we liked to call by that name, was lying in wait for me, ready to claim the first interest in the portion of life I had dared to borrow. He said this slowly, as if measuring each word. He did not glance towards Eve, as he had done in his previous pause. His whole manner seemed oppressed by the gravity of what he had still to say. "'I doubt if a man has ever seen more in half an hour than I have to-night,' he said. "'I'm speaking of mental seeing, of course.' In this play, other men's shoes, two men change identities, as Chilcott and I have done. But in doing so, they overlooked one fact, the fact that one of them has a wife. That's not my way of putting it. It's the way it was put to be by one of Lady Astrup's party. Again Eve looked up. The doubt and question in her eyes had grown unmistakably. As he ceased to speak, her lips parted quickly. John, she said with sudden conviction, you're trying to say something, something that's terribly hard. Without raising his head, Loder answered her. Yes, he answered, the hardest thing a man ever said. His tone was short, almost brusque, but to ears sharpened by instinct it was eloquent. Without a word, Eve took a step forward, and standing quite close to him, laid both hands on his shoulders. For a space they stood silent, she with her face lifted, he with averted eyes. Then very gently he raised his hands and tried to unclasp her fingers. There was scarcely any colour visible in his face, and, by a curious effect of emotion, it seemed that lines, never before noticeable, had formed about his mouth. "'What is it?' Eve asked apprehensively. "'What is it?' By a swift, involuntary movement she had tightened the pressure of her fingers, Without using force, it was impossible for Loder to unloose them. With his hands pressed irresolutely over hers, he looked down into her face. "'As I sat in the theatre to-night, Eve,' he said slowly, "'all the pictures I'd formed of life shifted. Without desiring it, without knowing it, my whole point of view was changed. I suddenly saw things by the world's searchlight instead of by my own miserable candle.' I suddenly saw things for you, instead of for myself. Eve's eyes widened and darkened, but she said nothing. I suddenly saw the unpardonable wrong that I have done you, the imperative duty of cutting it short. He spoke very slowly, in a dull, mechanical voice. Eve, her eyes still wide, her face pained and alarmed, withdrew her hands from his shoulders. You mean she said with difficulty, that it is going to end, that 
you are going away, that you are giving everything up. Oh, but you can't, you can't, she exclaimed with sudden excitement, her fears suddenly overmastering her incredulity. You can't, you mustn't. The only proof that could have interfered. I wasn't thinking of the proof. Then of what? Of what? Loda was silent for a moment. Of our love, he said steadily. She coloured deeply. But, but, but why? she stammered. Why? We have done no wrong. We need do no wrong. We would be friends, nothing more, and I, I, I so need a friend. For almost the first time in Loda's knowledge of her, her voice broke, her control deserted her. She stood before him in all the pathos of her lonely girlhood, her empty life. The revelation touched him with sudden poignancy. The real strength that lay beneath his faults, the chivalry buried under years of callousness, stirred at the birth of a new emotion. The resolution preserved at such a cost, the sacrifice that had seemed well-nigh impossible, all at once took on a different shape. What before had been a barren duty became suddenly a sacred rite. Holding out his arms, he drew her to him as if she had been a child. Eve, he said gently, I've learnt tonight how fully a woman's life is at the mercy of the world, and how scanty that mercy is. If circumstances had been different, I believe, I am convinced, I would have made you a good husband, would have used my right to protect you as well as a man could use it. And now that things are different, I want, I should like, he hesitated a very little, now that I have no right to protect you, except the right my love gives, I want to guard you as closely from all that is sordid as any husband could guard his wife. In life there are really only two broad issues, right and wrong. Whatever we may say, whatever we may profess to believe, we know that our action is always a choice between right and wrong. A month ago, a week ago, I would have despised a man who could talk like this, and have thought myself strong for despising him. Now I know that strength is something more than the trampling of others into the dust that we ourselves may have a clear road, that it is something much harder and much less triumphant than that, that it is standing aside to let somebody else pass on. Eve, he exclaimed suddenly, I'm trying to do this for you. Don't you see? Don't you understand? The easy course, the happy course, would be to let things drift. Every instinct is calling to me to take that course, to go on as I have done, trading on Chilcot's weakness and your generosity. But I won't do it. I can't do it. With a swift impulse he loosed his arms and held her away from him. Eve, it's the first time I've put another human being before myself. Eve kept her head bent. Painful, inaudible sobs were shaking her from head to foot. It's something in you, something unconscious, something high and fine that holds me back, that literally bars the way. Eve, can't you see that I'm fighting, fighting hard? After he had spoken there was silence, a long, painful silence, during which Eve waged the battle that so many of her sex have waged before, the battle in which words are useless and tears of no account. She looked very slight, very young, very forlorn, as she stood there. Then, in the oppressive sense of waiting that filled the whole room, she looked up at him. Her face was stained with tears, her thick black lashes were still wet with them, but her expression, as her eyes met Loder's, was a strange example of the courage, the firmness, the power of sacrifice that may be hidden in a fragile vessel. She said nothing for in such a moment words do not come easily. But with the simplest, most submissive, most eloquent gesture in the world, she set his perplexity to rest. Taking his hand between hers, she lifted it, and for a long, silent space, held it against her lips. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Thirty Three. For a while there was silence. Then Loder, a bitterly aware that he had conquered, poignantly conscious of the appeal that Eve's attitude made, 
found further endurance impossible. Gently freeing his hand, he moved away from her to the fireplace, taking up the position that she had first occupied. "'Eve,' he said slowly, "'I haven't finished yet. I haven't said everything. I'm going to tax your courage further.' With a touch of pained alarm, Eve lifted her head. "'Further?' she said. Loda shrank from the expression on her face. Uh, "'Yes,' he said with difficulty. "'There's still another point to be faced. "'The matter doesn't end with my going back. "'To have the situation fully saved, Chilcot must return. "'Chilcot must be brought to realise his responsibilities.' "'Eve's lips parted in dumb dismay. "'It, it must be done,' he went on hurriedly. "'And we've got to do it, you and I.' He turned and looked at her. I? I could do nothing. What could I do? Her voice failed. Everything, he said. You could do everything. He is morally weak, but he has one sensitive point, the fear of a public exposure. Once make it plain to him that you know his secret, and you can compel him to whatever course of action you select. It was to ask you to do this, to beg you to do this, that I came to you to-night. I know that it's demanding more than a woman's resolution, more than a woman's strength. But you are like no woman in the world. Eve, he cried with sudden vehemence, can't you see that it's imperative, the one thing to save us both? He stopped abruptly as he had begun, and again a painful silence filled the room. Then, as before, Eve moved instinctively towards him, but this time her steps were slow and uncertain. Nearing his side, she put out her hand as if for comfort and support, and, feeling his fingers tighten around it, stood for a moment resting in the contact. "'I understand,' she said at last, very slowly. "'I understand. When will you take me to him?' For a moment Loda said nothing, not daring to trust his voice. Then he answered, low and abruptly. "'Now,' he said. "'Now, at once, now this moment, if I may, "'and and remember that I know what it costs you.' "'As if imbued with fear that his courage might fail him, "'he suddenly released her hand, "'and, crossing the room to where a long, dark cloak lay "'as she had thrown it on her return home, "'he picked it up, walked to her side, "'and silently wrapped it about her. "'Then, still acting automatically, "'he moved to the door, opened it, "'and stood aside while she passed out into the corridor.' In complete silence they descended the stairs and passed to the hall door. There, Crapham, who had returned to his duties since Loder's entrance, came quickly forward with an offer of service. But Loder dismissed him curtly, and with something of the confusion bred of Chilcot's regime, the man drew back towards the staircase. With a hasty movement, Loder stepped forward, and opening the door, emitted a breath of chill air. Then on the threshold he paused, it was his first sign of hesitation, the one instant in which nature rebelled against the conscience so tardily awakened. He stood motionless for a moment, and it is doubtful whether even Eve fully fathomed the bitterness of his renunciation, the blackness of the night that stretched before his eyes. Behind him was everything. Before him, nothing. The everything symbolised by the luxurious house, the eagerly attentive servants, the pleasant atmosphere of responsibility— the nothing represented by the broad public thoroughfare, the passing figures each unconscious of and uninterested in his existence. As an interloper he had entered this house. As an interloper, a masquerader, he had played his part, lived his hour, proved himself. As an interloper he was now passing back into the dim world of unrealised hopes and unachieved ambitions. He stood rigidly quiet, his strong figure silhouetted against the lighted hall, his face cold and set. Then, with a touch of fatality, chance cut short his struggle. An empty hansom wheeled round the corner of the square. The cabman, seeing him, raised his whip in query, and, involuntarily, he nodded an acquiescence. A moment later he had helped Eve into the cab. "'A Middle Temple Lane,' he directed, pausing on the step. "'Middle Temple Lane is opposite to Clifford's Inn,' he explained as he took his place beside her. "'When we get out there we have only to cross Fleet Street.' Eve bent her head in token that she understood, 
and the cab moved out into the roadway. Within a few minutes the neighbourhood of Grosvenor Square was exchanged for the noisier and more crowded one of Piccadilly. But either the cabman was over-cautious, or the horse was below the average, for they made but slow progress through the more crowded streets. To the two, sitting in silence, the pace was well-nigh unbearable. With every added movement the tension grew. The methodical care with which they moved seemed like the tightening of a string already strained to breaking point. Yet neither spoke, because neither had the courage necessary for words. Once or twice, as they traversed the strand, Loda made a movement as if to break the silence, but nothing followed it. He continued to lean forward with a certain dogged stiffness, clasped hands resting on the doors of the cab, his eyes staring straight ahead. Not once, as they threaded their way, did he dare to glance at Eve, though every movement, every stir of her garments, was forced upon his consciousness by his acutely awakened senses. When at last they drew up before the dark archway of Middle Temple Lane, he descended hastily, and as he mechanically turned to protect Eve's dress from the wheel, he looked at her fully for the first time since their enterprise had been undertaken. As he looked, he felt his heart sink. He had expected to see the marks of suffering on her face, but the expression he saw suggested something more than mere mental pain. All the rich colour that usually deepened and softened the charm of her beauty had been erased as if by a long illness, and against the new pallor of her skin, her blue eyes, her black hair and eyebrows, seemed startlingly dark. A chill colder than remorse, a chill that bordered upon actual fear, touched Loda in that moment. With the first impulsive gesture he had allowed himself, he touched her arm. E Eve, he began unsteadily, then the word died off his lips. Without a sound, almost without a movement, she returned his glance, and something in her eyes checked what he might have said. In that one expressive look he understood all she had desired, all she had renounced, the full extent of the ordeal she had consented to, and the motive that had compelled her consent. He drew back with the heavy sense that repentance and pity were equally futile, equally out of place. Still in silence, she stepped to the pavement, and stood aside while Loda dismissed the cab. To both there was something symbolic, something prophetic, in the dismissal. Without intention, and almost unconsciously, they drew closer together as the horse turned, its hoofs clattering on the roadway, its harness jingling. And still without realisation, they looked after the vehicle as it moved away, down the long, shadowed thoroughfare, towards the lights and the crowds that they had left. At last, involuntarily, they turned towards each other. Come, Loda said abruptly, it's only across the road. Fleet Street is generally very quiet once midnight is past, and Eve had no need of guidance or protection as they crossed the pavement, shining like ice in the lamplight. They crossed it slowly, walking apart, for the dread of physical contact that had possessed them in the cab seemed to have fallen on them again. Inquisitiveness has little place in the region of the city, and they gained the opposite footpath unnoticed by the casual passer-by. Then, still holding apart, they reached and entered Clifford's Inn. Inside the entrance they paused, and Eve shivered involuntarily. "'How grey it is!' she said faintly. "'And how cold, like a graveyard!' Loda turned to her. For one moment control seemed shaken. His blood surged, his vision clouded. The sense that life and love were still within his reach filled him overwhelmingly. He turned towards Eve. He half extended his hands. Then, stirred by what impulse, moved by what instinct, it was impossible to say, he let them drop to his sides again. Come, he said, come, this is the way. Keep close to me. Put your hand on my arm. He spoke quietly, but his eyes were resolutely averted from her face as they crossed the dim, silent court. Entering the gloomy doorway that led to his own rooms, he felt her fingers tremble on his arm, then tighten in their pressure as the bare passage and cheerless stairs met her view. But he set his lips. "'Come,' he repeated in the same strained voice. "'Come, it isn't far. Three or four flights.' With a white face and a curious expression in her eyes, Eve moved forward. 
She had released Loda's arm as they crossed the hall, and now, reaching the stairs, she put out her hand gropingly and caught the banister. She had a pained, numb sense of submission, of suffering that had sunk to apathy. Moving forward without resistance, she began to mount the stairs. The ascent was made in silence. Loda went first, his shoulders braced, his head held erect. Eve, mechanically watchful of all his movements, followed a step or two behind. With weary monotony, one flight of stairs succeeded another, each to her unaccustomed eyes seeming more colourless, more solitary, more desolate than the preceding one. Then at last, with a sinking sense of apprehension, she realised that their goal was reached. The knowledge broke sharply through her dulled senses, and, confronted by the closeness of her ordeal, she paused, her head lifted, her hand still nervously grasping the banister. Her lips parted as if in sudden demand for aid, but in the nervous expectation, the pained apprehension of the moment, no sound escaped them. Loda, resolutely crossing the landing, knew nothing of the silent appeal. For a second she stood hesitating. Then her own weakness, her own shrinking dismay, was submerged in the interest of his movements. Slowly mounting the remaining steps, she followed him as if fascinated towards the door that showed dingily conspicuous in the light of an unshaded gas-jet. Almost at the moment that she reached his side, he extended his hand towards the door. The action was decisive and hurried, as though he feared to trust himself. For a space he fumbled with the lock, and Eve, standing close behind him, heard the handle creak and turn under his pressure. Then he shook the door. At last, slowly, almost reluctantly, he turned round. "'I'm afraid things aren't quite right,' he said in a low voice. "'The door is locked, and I can see no light.' She raised her eyes quickly. "'But you have a key?' she whispered. "'Haven't you got a key?' It was obvious that to both the unexpected check to their designs was fraught with danger. "'Yes, but—' he looked towards the door. "'Yes, I have a key. Yes, you're right,' he added quickly. "'I'll use it. Wait while I go inside.' Filled with a new nervousness, oppressed by the loneliness, the silence about her, Eve drew back obediently. The sense of mystery conveyed by the closed door weighed upon her. Her susceptibilities were tensely alert as she watched Loda search for his key and insert it in the lock. With mingled dread and curiosity, she saw the door yield and gape open like a black gash in the dingy wall. And with a sudden sense of desertion she saw him pass through the aperture and heard him strike a match. The wait that followed seemed extraordinarily long. Listening intently, she heard him move softly from one room to the other, and at last, to her acutely nervous susceptibilities, it seemed that he paused in absolute silence. In the intensity of listening, she heard her own faint, irregular breathing, and the sound filled her with panic. The quiet, the solitude, the vague, instinctive apprehension became suddenly unendurable. Then all at once the tension was relieved. Loda reappeared. He paused for a second in the shadowy doorway. Then he turned unsteadily, drew the door to, and locked it. Eve stepped forward. Her glimpse of him had been momentary, and she had not heard his voice. Yet the consciousness of his bearing filled her with instinctive alarm. Abruptly, and without reason, her hands turned cold, her heart began to beat violently. John! she said below her breath. For answer he moved towards her. His face was bereft of colour. There was a look of consternation in his eyes. Come, he said. Come at once. I'm, I, I must take you home. He spoke in a shaken, uneven voice. Eve looked up at him, caught his hand. Why? Why? she questioned. Her tone was low and scared. Without replying, he drew her imperatively towards the stairs. "'Go very softly,' he commanded. "'No one must see you here.' In the first moment she bade him instinctively. Then, reaching the head of the stairs, she stopped. With one hand still clasping his, the other clinging nervously to the banister, she refused to descend. "'John,' she whispered, "'I'm not a child. What is it? What has happened? I must know.' 
For a moment Loder looked at her uncertainly. Then, reading the expression in her eyes, he yielded to her demand. "'He's dead,' he said in a very low voice. "'Chilcot is dead.' End of chapter 33Chapter 34 of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 34 To fully appreciate a great announcement, we must have time at our disposal. At the moment of Loder's disclosure, time was denied to Eve, for scarcely had the words left his lips before the thought that dominated him asserted its prior claim. Blind to the incredulity in her eyes, he drew her swiftly forward, and, half impelling, half supporting her, forced her to descend the stairs. Never in after-life could he obliterate the remembrance of that descent. Fear, such as he could never experience in his own concerns, possessed him. One desire overrode all others, the desire that Eve's reputation, which he himself had so nearly imperilled, should remain unimperilled. In the shadow of that urgent duty, the despair of the past hours, the appalling fact so lately realised, the future with its possible trials, became dark to his imagination. In his new victory over self, the question of her protection predominated. Moving under this compulsion, he guided her hastily and silently down the deserted stairs, drawing a breath of deep relief as, one after another, the landings were successfully passed. And, still actuated by the suppressed need of haste, he passed through the doorway that they had entered under such different conditions only a few minutes before. To leave the quiet court, to gain the strand, to hail a belated hansom, was the work of a moment. By an odd contrivance of circumstance, the luck that had attended every phase of his dual life was again exerted in his behalf. No one had noticed their entry into Clifford's Inn. No one was moved to curiosity by their exit. With an involuntary thrill of feeling, he gave expression to his relief. "'Thank God, it's over,' he said as the cab drew up. "'You don't know what the strain has been.' Moving as if in a dream, Eve stepped into the cab. As yet, the terrible denouement of the enterprise had made no clear impression upon her mind. For the moment, all that she was conscious of, all that she instinctively acknowledged, was the fact that Loder was still beside her. In quiet obedience she took her place, drawing aside her skirts to make room for him, and in the same subdued manner he stepped into the vehicle. Then, with the strange sensation of reliving their earlier drive, they were aware of the tightened rein and of the horse's first forward movement. For several seconds neither spoke. Eve, shutting out all other thoughts, sat close to Loder, clinging tenaciously to the momentary comforting sense of protection. Loder, striving to marshal his ideas, hesitated before the ordeal of speech. At last, realising his responsibility, he turned to her slowly. Eve, he said in a low voice, and with some hesitation, I want you to know that in, in all this, from the moment I saw him, from the moment I understood, I have had you in my thoughts, you and no one else. She raised her eyes to his face. "'Do you realise? he began afresh. "'Do you know what this—this this thing means?' "'Still she remained silent. "'It means that after tonight there will be no such person in London as John Loder. "'Tomorrow the man who is known by that name will be found in his rooms. "'His body will be removed, and at the post-mortem examination "'it will be stated that he died of an overdose of morphia.' His charwoman will identify him as a solitary man who lived respectably for years and then suddenly went downhill with remarkable speed. It will be quite a common case. Nothing of interest will be found in his rooms. No relation will claim his body. After the usual time he will be given the usual burial of his class. These details are horrible. But there are times when we must look at the horrible side of life, because life is incomplete without it. These things I speak of are the things that will meet the casual eye, but in our sight they will have a very different meaning. Eve, he said more vehemently, a whole chapter in my life has been closed tonight, and my first instinct is to shut the book and throw it away. 
but I'm thinking of you. Remember, I'm thinking of you. Whatever the trial, whatever the difficulty, no harm shall come to you. You have my word for that. I'll return with you now to Grosvenor Square. I'll remain there till a reasonable excuse can be given for Chilcot's going abroad. I will avoid Fred. I will cut politics, whatever the cost. Then, at the first reasonable moment, I will do what I would do now, tonight if it were possible. I'll go away, start afresh, do in another country what I have done in this. There was a long silence. Then Eve turned to him. The apathy of a moment before had left her face. "'In another country?' she repeated. "'In another country?' "'Yes, a, a fresh career in a fresh country, something clean to offer you. I'm not too old to do what other men have done.' He paused, and for a moment Eve looked ahead at the gleaming chain of lamps. Then, still very slowly, she brought her glance back again. "'No?' she said very slowly. "'You are not too old. "'But there are times when age and things like age "'are not the real consideration. "'It seems to me that your own inclination, "'your own individual sense of right and wrong, "'has nothing to do with the present moment. "'The question is whether you are justified in going away.' "'She paused, her eyes fixed steadily upon his. "'Whether you are free to go away and make a new life.' whether it is ever justifiable to follow a phantom life when when there's a lantern waiting to be carried. Her breath caught. She drew away from him, frightened and elated by her own words. Loda turned to her sharply. Eve, he exclaimed. Then his tone changed. You don't know what you're saying, he added quickly. You don't understand what you're saying. Eve leaned forward again. Yes, she said slowly, I do understand. Her voice was controlled, her manner convinced. She was no longer the girl conquered by strength greater than her own. She was the woman strenuously demanding her right to individual happiness. I understand it all, she repeated. I understand every point. It was not chance that made you change your identity, that made you care for me, that brought about his death. I don't believe it was chance. I believe it was something much higher. You are not meant to go away. As Loda watched her, the remembrance of his first days as Chilcot rose again, the remembrance of how he had been dimly filled with the belief that below her self-possession lay a strength, a depth, uncommon in woman. As he studied her now, the instinctive belief flamed into conviction. Eve, he said involuntarily, with a quick gesture, she raised her head. No, she exclaimed. No, don't say anything. You are going to see things as I see them. You must do so. You have no choice. No real man ever casts away the substance for the shadow. Her eyes shone. The colour, the glow, the vitality rushed back into her face. John, she said softly, I love you, and I need you. "'but there is something with a greater claim, a greater need than mine. "'Don't you know what it is?' "'He said nothing. He made no gesture. "'It is the party, the country. "'You may put love aside, but duty is different. "'You have pledged yourself. You are not meant to draw back.' "'Loda's lips parted. "'Don't,' she said again. "'Don't say anything. I know all that is in your mind.' "'But when we sift things right through, "'it isn't my love or our happiness that's really in the balance. "'It is your future.' "'Her voice thrilled. "'You are going to be a great man, "'and a great man is the property of his country. "'He has no right to individual action.' "'Again Loda made an effort to speak, "'but again she checked him. "'Wait!' she exclaimed. "'Wait! "'You believe you have acted wrongly, and you are... "'desperately afraid of acting wrongly again. "'But is it really truer, more loyal for us to work out a long probation "'in grooves that are already overfilled, "'than to marry quietly abroad and fill the places that have need of us? "'That is the question I want you to answer. "'Is it really truer and nobler? "'Oh, I see the doubt that is in your mind. 
"'You think it finer to go away and make a new life "'than to live the life that is waiting you. "'Because one is independent, "'and the other means the use of another man's name "'and another man's money. "'That is the thought in your mind. "'But what is it that prompts that thought?' "'Again her voice caught, but her eyes did not falter. "'I will tell you, it is not self-sacrifice, but pride.' "'She said the word fearlessly.' A flush crossed Loda's face. "'A man requires pride,' he said in a low voice. "'Yes, at the right time. But is this the right time? Is it ever right to throw away the substance for the shadow? You say that I don't understand, don't realise. I realise more tonight than I have realised in all my life. I know that you have an opportunity that can never come again, and that it's terribly possible to let it slip.' She paused. Loda, his hands resting on the closed doors of the cab, sat very silent, with averted eyes and bent head. "'Only to-night,' she went on, "'you told me that everything was crying to you to take the easy, pleasant way. Then it was strong to turn aside. But now it is not strong. It is far nobler to fill an empty niche than to carve one for yourself. "'John,' she suddenly leaned forward, laying her hands over his, Mr. Frey told me to-night that in his new ministry my my husband was to be under-secretary for foreign affairs. The words fell softly, so softly that to ears less comprehending than Loder's their significance might have been lost, as his rigid attitude and unresponsive manner might have conveyed lack of understanding to any eyes less observant than Eve's. For a long time there was no word spoken. At last, with a very gentle pressure, her fingers tightened over his hands. "'John,' she began gently, but the word died away. She drew back into her seat as the cab stopped before Chilcot's house. Simultaneously, as they descended, the hall door was opened, and a flood of warm light poured out reassuringly into the darkness. "'I thought it was your cab, sir,' Crapp had explained deferentially as they passed into the hall. Uh, "'Mr. Frayde has been waiting to see you this half-hour. "'I showed him into the study.' "'He closed the door softly and retired. "'Then, in the warm light, "'amid the gravely dignified surroundings "'that had marked his first entry "'into this hazardous second existence, "'Eve turned to Loda for the verdict "'upon which the future hung. "'As she turned, "'his face was still hidden from her, "'and his attitude betrayed nothing. "'John?' she said slowly. "'You know why he is here. You know that he has come to personally offer you this place, to personally receive your refusal, or consent.' She ceased to speak. There was a moment of suspense. Then Loder turned. His face was still pale and grave, with the gravity of a man who has but recently been close to death. But beneath the gravity was another look, the old expression of strength and self-reliance, tempered, raised, and dignified by a new humility. Moving forward, he held out his hands. My consent, or refusal, he said very quietly, lies with my wife. End of chapter 34 End of The Masquerader by Catherine Cecil Thurston